Well, hi, this is Paul, and this is the uh, this is my second talk with the very famous Esther O'Reilly, who's a blogger on Pathios, Young Fogey. And so, Esther, we've only got an hour, so you know, no sense, no sense with uh, with chit chitter chat here. No. Dive right in. Okay, so um, a, a little bit of an update on and what's new with with my writing. Peterson related, yeah. IDW related. So I just sent my last edits to the Lexham Press editor who's working on this anthology. And I think you and Ron Dart are going to be doing another talk pretty soon. And so Yeah, we're talking this afternoon. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so, so he, he and I have become quite tight um, in, in recent weeks and months. He's been incredibly gracious and encouraging. Sweet, sweet guy. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm excited for him to share a little bit more about this anthology. I've seen some of the other essays, some very, very nice work. Um, and I'm really proud of, of my own contribution there. I had a funny thought as I was reading it back over. Um, I think a lot of people are probably going to kind of come away from it thinking that I'm a Catholic. <laughs> 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 because because I'm, I'm, I'm looking it over it, it's really, it's pretty suffused with, um, you know, is it Catholic language and thought and references uh, because I, I'm sort of, um, it, it would fit very nicely in the sort of great tradition of, of high humanism or Catholic humanism. Um, and it's a debate where, where Catholics really have all their ducks pretty firmly in a row and evangelicals are not quite as uh, organized, let's say. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so it's cool that the, the title will be uh, The Image of Christ, Jordan Peterson as Humanist. Um, so kind of, kind of trying to, kind of trying to steal back the idea of, of humanism and, and the idea of the, the word humanist is not something that Christians should go, oh, that's humanist. That's bad. I'm like, yeah. you know, because I, that's not how I was raised at all. And so I like slowly yeah. had to realize that people thought humanism was a bad thing. It's like, oh, no, 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 here, <laughs> let's, let's, let's rethink this. Yeah. Um, but, but so it that part of part of that essay sort of ties into what I want to talk about today because um, I want to talk some about literature um, and art because um, I there's there's a, a lot of callbacks to to various literary things and artistic things and even bits of poetry in the essay that I wrote because um, you know I've always needed art in my life as a you know kind of a sense making mechanism. Um, and a way of, of framing and seeing the world. And one of, one of the very first clips I saw of Peterson, you know, may have been like the third or fourth clip, um, was called Why You Need Art in Your Life. Hmm. And <laughs> funny enough, it was something that Kanye West was caught watching on his computer. <laughs> and ah. so somebody took a screen cap of it. I'm like, well, me and Kanye West, I guess. You know, like we, we, yep. we, both, we both found that clip uh, compelling. And uh, a snippet of it was going around recently in the wake of the, the Notre Dame Cathedral burning, because uh, in the course of it, Peterson's talking about the beauty of cathedrals and how the architecture of it, you know, it, it draws the eye upward and it, it creates awe and reverence. Um, and that you, know, like, you, you, you got to think, man, it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's so beautiful. Um, and so that, that whole clip is, is just fantastic because he's talking about how art is a way of apprehending the transcendent. Um, and he came back to it in his talk with Roger Scruton. And I was having trouble placing the clip, but he's talking about how it's, it's like when you look at a picture and it's framing it, he says, it's like it's telling you, look, look, and he makes a frame with his hands. Um, and it's like he can't even quite articulate what he's trying to get at, but uh, it's, it's just sort of coursing through him that he wants to get out what art does to you. And uh, he used this phrase in the, the biblical lecture clip where he, he, says, he says that you're stumbling towards the kingdom of God when you, when you experience it, engage with, and interact with art. Um, and he encourages the, the audience, he says, you need to just go get a piece of art and put it on your wall. Just, just do it. And I love it when he says, and you know, your, your friends might come by and have a look at it and kind of be like, oh, oh, 
what, what is that was that person no that's not like it's not like very good art and he goes but like it doesn't matter <laughs> just 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 and you might be like oh i think i think it's pretty and you're like oh brother you know but he's like don't pay attention to them just just enjoy the art have the art and he goes you have no taste you don't have any taste it's true don't worry about that <laughs> you know just go for it because we're all stumbling up the hill you know we're all stumbling towards the kingdom of god and i just i love the the sort of anti-elitist spirit of that you know because um you know some of the circles i run i run with some kind of artsy christian types who are you know they're they're always ready to to pick apart everyone's choices in artistic entertainment and they're always ready to say oh well you should be reading flannery o'connor instead or, or whatever you know like <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Um, and i there was one guy in particular a name that i thought of and may not may or may not ring a bell with you but do you remember a painter named thomas kincaid oh yeah yeah okay yeah i'm, I'm, I'm gonna date myself a little bit here but he was very very big when i was a little kid yeah. um, <laughs> so for christmas and birthdays i would get these these cute little mini jigsaw puzzles of the log cabins and the little yeah. castles and whatnot. Um, and so, you know, me being a, a sweet, naive little kid, I had no idea that, that Thomas Kincaid was, a, was a, a shyster and a huckster who was trying to, you know, pass off Christian kitsch on the unwitting masses. Uh, you know, I learned about all that later when I read all the think pieces. Um, but so it was very interesting to me how Kincaid sort of became the, the sort of archetypal whipping boy for everything wrong with Christian American art, you know. Um, so like no, no discussion of, of evangelicalism and art um, or American Christianity and art was complete without a dig at Thomas Kincaid, you know. Um, and that just always seemed a little odd to me. It was almost like people were weirdly obsessed with him, I, I guess, because I always just liked the lock habits, you know. I, I liked the way that he I liked the way he played with light, you know, like I have a, a, a memory of an image of a, a street in Christmas time with, with lamplight and snow. You know, it was, I just liked it, you know, I thought it was pretty, right? Like, you, can, you can't really just shellac Thomas Kincaid and give Courier and Ives a pass because yes. in a sense they're, they're yes. doing the same thing. Exactly. Um, but now here's the really sort of strange and sad and, and to me fascinating thing. When Thomas Kincaid died, he, he died pretty young and a lot of people learned sort of for the first time like all of the kind of nasty sordid details of his personal life because it, it turned out that he was pretty pretty messed up he was an alcoholic um, really i didn't know any of that yeah. no yeah he was an alcoholic he was divorced um like at, at one time he was walking around uh like saying nonsense words and, and like publicly urinating or something because he was so drunk um so and then, like, after he died, his wife and girlfriend were fighting over his estate, and it was just this this really, really unsavory, sordid uh, mess. Alcohol, Valium, and Smudges of Green Paint, says the yeah. uh, Jose yeah. Mercury News. Yeah. Interesting. So that, you know, it's like the art was no longer the same because you saw it with a new perspective, right? You know, um, so that really got me to, to thinking, like, what did, what did this mean? What did Thomas Kincaid's art mean with all of this in the background? And I suppose what it means is that we're all, we're stumbling towards the, the log cabin in the woods, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, <laughs> but, you, but you, you get, you get what I mean, you know? Yeah, I do get what you mean. Maybe maybe drunkenly stumbling for, for some of us. Um, and uh, it was, you know, I, I, I see it now, the way I think of it is that it was something like an escape um, for him. And a lot of people gave him a difficult time because they're like, oh, he doesn't grapple with darkness in his art. It's all just like happy, happy, happy all the time, all light and no shadows or darkness anywhere. It's such as such a kitschy, dishonest view of creation or, or view of the world. And I'm just like, well, I mean, it seems like he n did know something about shadows, though, <laughs> like in, yeah. in his own life. And um, the picture of the cabin, it symbolizes the, the, the moment when 
when the tears will be dry and, and when there, there won't be any darkness. And, and so that is what waits at the top of the hill, so to speak. And that's, it is that two words which we continue to stumble. And, you know, my, I think my grandparents have, uh, have a Kincaid on their wall, actually. Uh, and, you know, no, no, doubt, no doubt somebody might walk by and go, uh -huh. of course, they would have a Thomas Kincaid on the wall. They're that kind of, they're those kind of people, right? The kind of people who hang Thomas Kincaid on the wall because they think it's pretty. Um, and so that was, that was just kind of, a, kind of a thought I had about the role that art plays. Um, so I have, I have various recommendations and things kind of, uh, kind of lined up here, like some of the, some of the art that I, I need in my own life. Um, so there's, there's a quote here by a guy named... Uh, Esther, why don't you start yeah. a podcast? Ha, I don't have time. I, I'm busy. I have to write a dissertation and I have to write an essay collection. <laughs> um, Actually, the, surely you could have time for a podcast. No, it's you know I, I what I don't want to make that kind of commitment because then I'll be expected to do something every week, and, and I don't know if I can keep that up. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, actually, the same press, you know, like short interlude, the same press that's doing this Peterson anthology actually actually wants a, a, an essay collection from me, like on on you know life, the universe, and everything. And so you know, I'm sort of going from. Oh wow! They want my essays too. Oh sh shoot! They want my essays. So, so that means means I have to means I have to write more because I don't have enough yet. Means I have to do some more some more research and gathering and thinking. And so that you know, does doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> it, it so so work. why are you getting an advanced degree in math? Because it will it it, it will give me a better chance of, of being able to work than uh, a humanities degree. Interesting. Yeah, um, you know, because everyone wants to teach English, right? Everyone wants to teach writing and literature, that, that kind of thing. Um, but m way fewer people want to teach math. And so people are kind of desperate for math teachers. Um, so Do that, you get a PhD in math to teach college math or something? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Oh, okay. You can, yeah. you can make much more in industry, of course. To get a PhD in math, depending on, I imagine, what you focus on. Eh, I don't. I'm not, that's not me. I like teaching. That's my. That's, that's my thing. <laughs> I, I would be. I would that be that is true. That is true. I would be unhappy in industry. No, but but there's there's other practical aspects to it as well. I just it really it worked out really nicely as far as my practical situation at the moment. Um, to to do a PhD, there's a good program in, in my hometown. Um, it's so, you know, multiple factors that kind of went into it. Okay. Um, I've also just gained a, a lot of valuable skills from it, you know, skills of, of being able to assimilate very, very difficult material, uh, which are, those are going to stand me a good stead if I now want to branch out and learn more about, I don't know, more about science or and anything, you know. Uh, it, it also, it also uh, divested me of, of all, <laughs> any, any cockiness <laughs> you know, because ma yeah. mathematics will, it, yeah. it, it, it will smack you down and you get it there. You're like, oh, I'm pretty smart. And then yeah. look around, you see some of your, some of your yeah. fellow grad students. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not really that smart. I didn't uh, even get that far. I was, I was still in my undergrad thinking about a math major and I looked around the room and I thought I could do this, but these guys are doing this without trying. I'm in the wrong yeah. place. So right. I got out. Well, and, you know, I, some, some students I see who they could do a PhD, uh, but they don't. You know, they go, ah, I'm going to go get a job. And they, they'll, they just go out with their master's. Usually they have some other skill like coding or whatnot. So I haven't happened to develop that particular skill. I, I knew what I wanted to do. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm content with this. But I, I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted yeah. you. Go ahead with your book recommendation. Oh, no, no problem. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm about to launch into it's funny because, you know, I have the degree to teach math, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to sort of sketch a, a, a literature class for you in a sense. Like, you know, if, if I were teaching lit, here's, here's what I would, uh, <laughs> here's what I would line up for, for, for everyone. Um, so for, first of all, here, here's an author. I, you may not know him by name, but I'm sure you know one of his stories. Have you ever heard of a uh, writer named Joseph Conrad? No. Okay. Do you know the story Heart of Darkness? 
Sounds familiar. They made a movie out of it. Yeah, yeah. It, they they made it into Apocalypse Now. Essentially, it was it was kind of a, a remake of, huh. of that story. Um, but so the, the quote I'm actually going to read comes from the the preface to a different story of his, uh, much less well known. And it's called uh, you know you'll have to edit this one carefully, Paul. It's called The Nigger of the Narcissus. Um, uh, so, there goes my YouTube channel. There goes your YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so the preface that Conrad wrote to this story is, is one of the best pieces of writing about writing that, that I've ever seen. And it really dovetails with the things that Peterson is saying. And so he's talking about the task of the artist, specifically the task of the writer. Um, and he, he writes, my task, which I'm trying to achieve is by the power of the written word to make you hear, to make you feel. It is before all to make you see hmm. that that and no more, and it is everything. If I succeed, you shall find there, according to your deserts, encouragement, consolation, fear, charm, all you demand, and perhaps also that glimpse of truth for which you have forgotten to ask. <laughs> and so it's, it's quite an indictment of the reader in some sense, um, because, you know, his, his point is, I'm not here to, to sort of offer the reader easy gratification. You know, if the reader just comes and goes, hey, I want to sort of punch some buttons and out comes an emotion, out comes a feeling, that's not, that's not my job. That's not what I'm here to give you. I'm here to, to shine a light on things which maybe you would rather not see, uh, but the things that you should see. And uh, I think in so many ways, Peterson, Peterson is much like a great novelist or a great fiction writer even though he's never written any fiction, because when he tells stories, especially some of the stories from his clinical practice, that's, that's what he's doing. You know, he's, he's lighting up those dark corners and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable reading about some of these people, some of these people, some of their problems. I, eh, this, this makes me uncomfortable, but that's a good thing, you know. Didn't Peterson write a play? <clears throat> that's in the back of my mind. My Douglas friend. Murray wrote a play. Uh, Peterson no, Peterson play. wrote some fic, some fictionalized something. Oh well, he was yeah. he was working on something. I think he was working on some kind of hard boiled thing, and he was inflicting it on his family at Christmas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah. like yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, so he's got some of that kind of rattling around in yeah. his in his mind. Um, but so so there's a particular story that he often tells, which I, I wove into my, my essay now, and I kind of paired it with one of the books I'm, I'm going to recommend. Um, so here's, here we go. First book recommendation. Uh, Esther, I'm feeling particularly colonized. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. This is a good thing. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> this is, you can listen it back later and make a list and take notes and, and lengthen your reading list even more, Paul. <laughs> I'm, blogging, I'm blogging as you type. I'm just adding new things. I've got okay, two okay. posts already. All right, so, so write this one down. Write this one down. Well, okay. You got another one for me. I got Thomas Kincaid's death. I got Joseph Conrad, Task of the Artist. I found that on brain picking. So oh, we're, okay. we're just getting started. We're just getting started. Here That's we go. what I'm afraid of. Go ahead. Okay. A, um, a Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller. Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah, so this is a, a deeply weird, deeply Catholic science fiction novel. Um, and so it's, it's got a, a post-apocalyptic kind of setting. So the civilization has, has destroyed itself with the A-bomb. Um, and it's basically up to the monks <laughs> to, to, to try to um, save what can be saved and you know, hold on to whatever little scraps are left behind uh, in, in hopes that one day it can be rebuilt. And so it's divided into three parts, uh, each of which drops into like a different era. So there's a scene in the, the second one, the middle one, uh, where a, a figure arises who's, who's kind of like the next Einstein, basically. Um, he's, he's very brilliant, he's very arrogant, um, and the, the monks of the, the church really don't like him, but they know they're going to have to work with him because he's basically the only hope for restoring Western civilization again, or a big part of it anyway. Um, so he, you have to understand that history as we know it, our history is so far back in the deep past 
that people still wonder if it if it ever actually happened. And so at, at what point the scientist says, I just, I'm not sure I can believe that it's true that we went mm -hmm. to the moon once, that we ever split the atom, that, that mankind ever did these things. Because, you know, look, look around you now, we've got these, look, look at how, how far man has sunk. Because like in the wake, in the wake of the A-bomb, you had uh, like radiation poisoning, um, people being born with various mutations, people being, uh, mentally impaired, that kind of thing. So the scientist, he, he's in the office with a priest. And he says, come here, look out the window. I, I want to show you something. <clears throat> so they look out the window and he goes, you see that there's, there's an old peasant guy walking down the road and he's leading his donkey home. And, you know, look, you could tell he's, he's, he's diseased. Uh, you know, he's, he's got paresis, um, which, which is lowering his IQ even farther. What, what do you see? When, when you look at that, at that guy, and the priest answers the image of Christ, what did you expect me to see? <laughs> and it's, it's this, this amazing, amazing moment. Um, hmm. And so that, that moment in my mind, I thought of it when I listened to a story Peterson tells several times now, and it's, it's also buried in, in maps of meaning. It's, it's this amazing, startling passage it's, it sort of leaps out of that book with, with this amazing, painful clarity after, you know, all these pages of, of, of tortured, <laughs> you know, tortured working. And then all of a sudden you reach this, it's like a, a thunderbolt. This is when he talks about this, uh, this woman that he met when he was a young uh, postdoc. And she, she was pathologically shy and she kept coming in and he was sort of trying to to help her improve, but he couldn't really make any progress. And then he figured out that the reason she had been coming is that she wanted to see if she could take her dog and, uh, and, and give some of, the, some of the inpatients at the clinic a walk outside. Um, and she, she was thinking about this, even though her own situation was incredibly dire, you know, I mean, like her, her home life, such as it was, was completely dysfunctional. There was mental illness and, and physical illness. Um, and she herself looked like a street person, you know, she was, she was incredibly unkempt and dirty and, and really not very bright at all and unable to, to look up at anybody because she was like bent over double with shyness. But she was, she was still, she had that spark of divinity, right, that, that Peterson talks about. Um, and so I, I thought about that. I, I thought about how she well, it's like it says in the book of Isaiah, how Christ had no beauty that men should desire him, you know. And so here's this woman, no man will ever desire her, at, ever, you know. Um, and so you could imagine somebody going, well, I mean, what, what do you see when, when you look at her? Well, you see the image of Christ, right? And that's what Peterson sees, even though he uh, doesn't quite have all the vocabulary to put to it yet, you know? Um, and so when, when, he, when he tells that story, he's, he's making us see, you know, just like, just like Conrad talks about. So I, I kind of, I, I pull that in, I kind of wove that together with, with that, that scene from, from Leibowitz in, in my essay. And I think, I think people are gonna, people are gonna enjoy that when they, when they get to it. Um, so let me, let me see if I can go down my, but so I, I want to kind of emphasize religious fiction because I think, <laughs> um, I think Esther, people are yeah. going to wonder if you're capable of a conversation. Am I capable of a conversation? Yeah. Well, you can, you can ask me. <laughs> you can ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> that would be your dream come true, Esther O'Reilly, AMA. <laughs> Come on, well, Esther, tell us the truth. Why, you know, you know, I, there, there are a few of us that are, are probably rightly uh, critiqued for being fixated on Jordan Peterson. Why are you fixated on Jordan Peterson? Well, I mean, s some of it I've been, I've been kind of elaborating here and, and also in our last conversation. And yeah, those are the reasons, but, but, they're, but they're all kind of out there. I mean, what about... What about you? Because 
there's, I mean, cause part of the funny thing is, so a lot of the people who come to my channel, you, you never say anything about Jonathan Peugeot, which is kind of interesting to me. And because a lot of the people who come to my channel come through Peugeot, you're definitely not a through a Peugeot Christian. Um, yeah, I only, I only discovered him by sort of getting into this whole Peterson thing. So, I mean, I, yeah, I love his art, but I, I don't know that much more about him. I, I don't like frequent his So you're, much. you are, you are kind of the, so, so in other words, it's not through kind of the neo-sacramentalism, as I call it. That's not the angle that you come at Peterson through. Well, so I, I, I that, am, in, I am in fact a sacramentalist. Um, no, I, I get that. I get that. But, you know, so I don't know if you saw the video I put out last night where I had this little clip from, from this doctor. And he talked about Jordan. Oh, I was starting to watch that, but I, I didn't finish it. Well, yet. you don't have two hours to, <laughs> to devote. To... <laughs> it's been a chaotic weekend, Paul. <laughs> I'm like getting your PhD in math and writing your blog and being on Twitter and all of those things. Well, um, actually, I, I had a car crash, but that's a different story. But <laughs> go, keep going. <laughs> so, but but it's it's interesting to me, you know, is it? So, so that guy made the observation and I can't wait. I will, I will eventually play the whole video that the whole conversation I had with him because the whole conversation is really amazing, but he, he's a really smart guy and he had some really clever insights, but you know, he made the point that Peterson, Peterson really comes along in a sense as the antidote to the, the new atheists. And he, he really is the one that in many ways kind of just calls stop uh, BS on their entire view of the world. And, and whereas, you know, Christian apologists have for a long time, you know, you, 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 Alvin Plantinga, who I know you know, um, Alvin Plantinga for a long time has made snide remarks about the new atheists, basically. You know, why can't we get any real atheists like Bertrand Russell or someone like that? Instead, we have these, we have these minor leaguers that are, that are, you know, popping up with their books and such. Well, you know, Bert, Bertrand Russell was a lightweight, yeah, even in his day. But, <laughs> well, but, my, my, but my point is, Esther, I want to know why I want to know why you're fascinated with Peterson. Be and, because because he's a humanist. <laughs> OK, well, well, OK. So we began and we talked a little bit about, you know, you're a lot of people because, in fact, when I used humanist to describe Peterson, it was very interesting because a number of people are like, no, he's not a humanist. I'm thinking because there are Christians saying, no, he's not a humanist. It's like. I don't mean, I don't mean, I mean, there are Christian humanists. I don't think that there's a, there's a problem with that. So I, what do you, I am one, you, yes. <laughs> right. So what do you mean by humanism? So what, what I mean by, by humanism is, is the, is the apprehension of the infinite value of man. Okay. Um, and so that, you know, Peterson, I think it embodies that. And, and I think that that's accessible to, to anyone. It doesn't matter if, if you if you come with presuppositions about the existence of God, or or not. It, well, that's it that's helpful. Manifests itself to you. Yeah, well, that's helpful for me because that then fits into you um, much more of the rest of your profile as an as an evangelical. Um, I mean, I, I I think of myself as a, a, a you know. Do you consider yourself an evangelical? Not strictly, no. Somewhat. It's what is some an ways. evangelical? I just got asked that today. It's like, oh. I, I think, I, I don't know if you can define what an evangelical is, because I, I haven't seen yet, I certainly haven't yet seen any list of, of things that, that I would be checking all of them and, and fully saying, yeah, I, th these 10 things apply to me, therefore I'm an evangelical. Maybe bits and pieces, but not all. I mean, I would say that I'm... Um, you believe in the need, you definitely believe in the need of religious conversion. You um, definitely believe yes, in the authority. But not, of but not necessarily right. I believe scripture is authoritative and, and inspired in some sense, although not necessarily inerrant. Um, so that's one respect dum, in which dum, I. Dum. Yeah, so, you know, in, in that sense, I, that's one reason why I'm hesitant to identify as an evangelical. And, um, I also don't know that I have the same view of conversion that many evangelicals would. I think, I think in some ways I borrow f somewhat from a Catholic view, although I, I don't completely subscribe to a Catholic view. Um, so what's the difference between a Catholic view of conversion and an evangelical view of conversion? Well, I mean, I, I think that 
Although so, some Catholics will say, no, no, you're misunderstanding. It's not like that. But I'm like, mm, if, you, if you read the Catholic documents, this kind of is what, what you're saying. Um, the, I mean, I, I, I think Catholics really do believe there is a sense in which you earn your salvation. Um, and so the, the, the classic evangelical response is, no, that's, that's impossible. Um, and, you know, certainly when you get into things, I don't know, like, like the treasury of merit, for example, is this, this Catholic view that's like you store up <laughs> brownie points or something. Um, and so, you know, along comes Martin Luther saying, no, no, sola fide, sola scriptura, can't, can't do it that way. It doesn't work that way. You so if someone to were to ask you, what does salvation mean? What would you say? What do you mean by salvation? I would say that salvation is a process. Um, I would say it's it's a it's a lifelong process of of being refined by God into that which He means for you to be. Okay, it's not a status. Well, I su I suppose it it depends on the context. Um, you mean like. Would you say, like, check the box, status saved, status not saved? That's you certainly know? how it's used in evangelical circles. I think that there, I think that there can be point, at a, at a point in time, you can say, is this person saved right now? Like, if this person died tonight, would he go to heaven? That's, you know, the, the standard kind of litmus test, right? If you died right now, et cetera. So I think that we can answer those questions meaningfully. Um, but I think that I think you can give a yes or no answer to that question and then also still hold to the idea that that we are we are works in progress um, and that, that we are we're being refined. Um, so I think you can lose salvation. Um, I, I think that I don't pull the, the line with a deconvert where people will go, well, yeah, that guy walked away from the church, but I, I don't think he was ever a Christian to begin with. Um, I don't, I don't say that. I, I think that, I think you could have been a Christian. You know, it, it says that, that when you were still, when you were still in the church, when you were still believing that uh, it, it was real, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't fake. Um, but then equally your loss of faith was, was real. Um, and your and your turning away from God was real, so you know this this may sort of wade into the Calvin, Calvinist Arminian thing. Uh, I'm sure you've heard the the illustration of a, you know the bird in the cage, right? So uh, does does the bird have to fly out of the cage uh, by his own will once God opens the door, or does God have to reach in and carry the bird out of the cage, right? So um, I've never that, heard that before. Oh, so I think this is helpful. So, um, <laughs> so you know, Peterson Peterson would say, Peterson would say that the bird has to open the cage and fly out of the cage all by itself. So that's that's the Pelagian view. You you do you do everything hmm. of your own power. The Arminian would say God has to open the cage, but the bird has to fly out. The Calvinist would say Birdie is dead at the bottom of the cage. <laughs> God has to reach it and pick the birdie up and carry it out. After Fly! It. Right. God, God pull, takes the bird out of the cage, does CPR on the bird. Exactly. And then the bird flies away. That's, that's Calvinism. That's right? the better story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Roman Catholic idea of conversion, you talked about the process, but differentiating Roman Catholic conversion from, let's say, evangelical conversion, is there a difference in terms of outcome? Well, can you, can you clarify that? So, like, do I think that you can be Catholic and saved or evangelical and well, saved? Well, I asked, we had talked about conversion and, yeah. and, and you differentiated Roman Catholic idea from conversion and evangelical idea for, of conversion. I had never thought of that. And I would understand the, a difference between Roman Catholic idea of conversion in terms of process from evangelical conversion, and that's kind of where you went. But the um, some of the know, orthodox the, the orthodox idea is interesting to me because when I hear people talk about it, it sounds similar 
to my own view, because I, I would say I have a synergistic view. Um, I'd have to learn more about Orthodox theology, though, to to be sure, because I, I do know there are other aspects of it that I, I would disagree with. And so I, I would want to be careful before saying, yes, that's definitely it, you know. Have but, you read Have you read Molly Worthen's um, book on evangelicalism? You must have, you might have heard nah, of it. I don't really read books on evangelicalism. I, I <laughs> just don't. I it's don't a good find, book. I find it very um, interesting. Okay. Um, let, uh, let's see what it's, what's it called? Um, let's see. Uh, University of North Carolina's, she's a historian from there. I didn't know anything about her. What's the name of that book? I read it though, because it was a really good book. Um, come on, why doesn't Wikipedia tell me? Da, 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 da. So you gotta, you gotta look it up on Amazon. Anyway, that makes this make this makes for bad video. Me looking up stuff. <laughs> um, well, I would say uh, to, to go on with with respects in which I may be more evangelical than Catholic. Um, so w one one vital thing I think about apostles the of reason. Okay, go on. Oh, apostles of reason. Yeah. So I, I was going to say, you know, one of I, I think I think multiple reasons why we needed the Protestant Reformation um, was was to recenter the focus on the individual. Um, because, the, you know, the idea of a magisterium um, and, and, you know, this, this filter through which you have to go in order to make sure that you're interpreting scripture properly, um, the notion of an infallible pope, you know, these, these sorts of ideas I, I don't think are biblical. Um, and, and so it was very important that there be a sort of unhitching from, from those ideas. And, so, you know, those are Trending some of the back of accretions. Yeah. So those are some of the big reasons why I, I'm not, in fact, Catholic, even though I borrow shamelessly from the Catholic tradition for a, a lot of my thinking. Um, but I, 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 I simply can't sign on to this. Yes, I agree. The Pope is infallible. Yes. You know, I agree. The magisterium, the, you know, the church. It's like I'm, I'm sort of helpless on my own. I need, I need the church to do X, Y and Z for me. It's like, well, no, I, I disagree with that. I, I, I believe there shouldn't be any barriers between the individual and, and the scripture. So in that sense, I'm a very classic Protestant thinker. Well, there's been a, you know, there's been a big movement back towards, um, I, I reformed in my denomination, I call them, you know, Catholic, um, Catholic reformed or reformed Catholics that, there's been a, you know, some of the, some people, some people in my class made in my class and younger have, have been really reading Calvin in terms of um, Catholicity much more than let's say some of the accretions that happened after Calvin. And when they read Calvin himself, they see, you know, Calvin was really a synthesizer of you know, took Luther and, and a bunch of the other reformers because there are a lot more reformers than just Luther, obviously. And and then also reading in terms of Calvin was, along with many people of his age, you know, well read in the church fathers, at least the the Western church fathers, and so on and so forth. So that's that's a that's a fairly that's a that's a fairly popular thing right now in reformed circles to get much better in touch with in touch with your catholicity and and also you know one of the things that uh, Molly, Molly Worthen mentioned in her book Apostles of Reason was once orthodox theology came to be better known in the west since in, in many ways kind of the um, the the dis the difficulties of a lot of the traditional orthodox churches in their places of origin in the east um, there's been a lot of there's been a lot more respect for orthodox theology since then. So it's right. it's been interesting in the last twenty years how much of this has has kind of been coming about. It's a it's kind of a new a new orthodox um, ecumenism as opposed to some of the what passes for ecumenicity on the more mainline stage. Yeah, I, I mean I've had a number of Protestant friends who just convert to orthodoxy or just convert to Catholicism. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting because as I'm watching the sort of influx of evangelicals into orthodoxy, I, I'm wondering who will colonize whom. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. To, you know, because I think there's some some of each, and there's some there's some pathologies in orthodoxy that I think evangelicals could could help to correct. And so that I'm in a sense I'm I'm glad, although I, I want to say you didn't have to go all the way, man. Like you know, you could have just been a weird evangelical. It's 
<laughs> like me, right? You know, or, or like me, sort of, I don't know what I am. But I was going to say, you mentioned in one of your videos that Anglicanism is the new hotness in some uh, areas. In like a lot of ways, yeah, yeah. amongst well, that's, millennials. That's very interesting to me because, I mean, I, I grew up in a, um, a sort of aggressively unhot uh, strain of Anglicanism, um, which is continuing Anglicanism, um, because you, you That's may... what it's called, continuing Anglicanism? Yeah, so this was a kind of a splinter group after, so the Anglican Church had this schism over um, various issues. The ordination of women was, was one major splitting issue um, in the 90s, I think. I'd have to refresh my, my memory on the history of it. So the continuing Anglican branch sort of took off on its own, but you know, it's sort of quietly dying, I guess, you know, probably it's, it's, it's fair to say there, the churches are very, very small. My own church is handkerchief sized. I mean, there's maybe only 10 people at, at most of a Sunday. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of independence, you know, we just do liturgy and mass the way that we like it, but it's a very much a dying breed, you know, it's so, huh. Yeah, so it's, it was interesting to hear you say that because I thought, well, that maybe maybe it's some sense, you know, sort of um, Angl Anglicanism is the new hotness in the sense that you have like a post-Vatican II Rome. Um, there, are probably, there are probably aspects of the hot new Anglicanism that would be somewhat foreign to my experience of it. Um, because it's probably incorporated certain elements like the ordination of women, for example. Right. Um, yeah. Well, Tish Warren, of course, is, is out there. Um, I, I've just noticed that amongst millennials, a, you know, a, a, a resurgent interest in Anglicanism and a number of the people, number of millennials that I've spoken with are now in Anglican churches. The, mm -hmm. the yeah. Anglican, the Anglican church that I, um, that hosted me. It wasn't really the church that hosted me. It was really a member of the church that hosted me, but he was a member of that church. And so we did it all in, in the building and with the blessing of the, of the pastor. But it was, it was very interesting because they were in Australia. In Australia, I, I regularly heard a bit of lament of the, of the Hillsong takeover of the church of Australia. Oh yeah. It's, it's very bad. And I mean, it's praise and worship has become, like, like when you were flipping through all the different celebs in the Liberty U video, and I was going through like, oh, yeah, I know that guy, I know that guy, I know that guy, I know that guy. So, so one of those guys was Chris Tomlin, and he's, a, he's an American writer. He's not with Hillsong, right. but, um, yeah, he's, he's big in the, the, the praise and worship. And so praise and worship has just become this global juggernaut in, in, terms, of, in terms of marketing. Um, and, you know, it's like, I'm sure that some of the writers are, are nice people. I'm, I'm a good capitalist. I don't begrudge them their, <laughs> their, their dollars, you know, more, more power to their elbow and all that. But it's, it's just destroyed the, the church as a space for meaningful worship, I think. And, um, well, actually, the, the, this comes into, this is a, a musician that I, I really like a lot that I'll, I'll throw out, speaking of, of art that I need in my life. Um, a guy named Rich Mullins, who yeah. was... Yeah, so he kind of made his made his mark in the '80s and '90s, and then and died abruptly in a, a car crash. Um, and he was thinking about becoming Catholic. And so it's funny, Catholics and Protestants alike have sort of fought over his legacy, tried to sort of claim him, and go, "He was really Catholic." No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. So yeah, you know, it's almost a little bit like, you know, I, I looking at the, the wake of Rachel Held Evans' death. It's been interesting because I get some similar kind of vibes with how people are rushing to like almost canonize her in a sense. People did the same with Rich Mullins because he had that that same sort of prophetic um, aura, I, I guess. But he he said some wise things about music at the church and worship music because he was looking at the rise of these these praise bands, you know. And and he said, I'm just not sure this is a good idea because it's it's about creating a particular emotion in people, yeah. a particular yeah. emotional response. And defining that as worship, yeah. when when I want to say that worship should be your whole life is an act of worship, right? right? Making your making your bed is an act of worship, right? Um, so the church is needs to be careful not to get sucked into this this sensationalism, 
And he said that about 25 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was very prescient because he was right. Well, what do you think of, you know, now that we're, I mean, you're not someone to shy from, from, uh, from controversy or, or shy from a fight. What do you think <laughs> of the response from, to Rachel Held Evans? I mean, Rod Dreher has blogged about a bit. And part of it is obviously the, the concern people want to be respectful to the morning. And, but, but she, I mean, it's, it's, it was funny <laughs> on my denominational page, they, they reposted, they, sometimes take stuff from a religious RNS, religious news service, and they reposted the, just the, the article that they had. But there's a line in that article basically about unity. And I thought, Rachel Held Evans will, will not be known for a, as a unifier. She'll be much more the, the Emma Green piece in the Atlantic as a fire brand. I mean, yeah, that was... well, you know, I, I liked, I thought Dreer was very sensible. I mean, he, he was talking about, you know, the, the, the backlash to anything remotely critiquing, you know, critical or, or, or negative about her work and her legacy. And he, and he goes, man, you know, he, he goes, I, I have Andrew Sullivan is this frenemy of mine. And boy, if I die, if I die and Andrew writes some sickly hagiographical thing, I'm going to haunt him to his dying day because, I, you know, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want just hagiographies in the, in the wake of my yeah. death. If there were people who disliked me, have at it, you know, go, yeah. go ahead and talk about it. Now, I mean, yeah, there, there should be sensitivity in class. And I've definitely seen people on the, you know, sort of right wing, so to speak, who, who did not uh, exhibit that, <laughs> needless to say. Um, but, but then there were other things, like, like Christianity Today ran a piece by John Stone Street, who I don't know him well, I met him once. And he's, you know, sort of a Chuck Colson, breakpoint apologist hmm. uh, guy. He was Greg the Apologist in, in her... Um, first book I think mm. and so he wrote what I thought was a a nice piece for Christianity today it was it was just kind of very touching like well you know I can't pretend that we agreed on on much of anything but she she had a story and and I I knew her husband and I, I really respect her family and, and you know it's a good reminder that everyone has a story so someone referred to it as a nasty piece and it's I'm sorry it just just wasn't um but then it, you know, they heard that somebody in her family read it and got offended. So Christianity Today pulled it and put out an apology. Yeah. You know, we're so sorry for this insensitive piece. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, people, you know, come on. So, um, yeah. You know, it I, seems, it yeah. seems that there might be some residual evangelical touchiness in, in, the, in the desire to canonize her rapidly. Yeah, but, well, I saw some art that someone did. With, she had a halo around her head and then Rod used that as a uh, the, the photo for his piece and that was real like some friend of hers had had actually drawn that to be serious <laughs> you know Rachel held Evans with a halo and I'm like wow that was fast <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> I mean, would never happen in the Catholic Church <laughs> takes a while but they have rules about canonizing yeah, not exactly. the evangelicals I know I, I know I See, know evangelicalism I think is 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 not I, I don't know how much, you know, certainly is an ecclesiastical movement, but part of me, you know, there's a, there's so much of a, evangelicalism so often seems to be the church of the marketplace. Um, it can be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, there's a certain amount of Catholic envy, maybe. <laughs> but it's market forces so often in evangelicalism that, that sort of determines, that sort of determines who the you know, who holds office. And so, you know, Rachel Held Evans held office in progressive evangelicalism by virtue of her power in social media. And then that, that got, because I, I, early on before Rachel really blew up, I, she had written, you know, I was, I'm, you know, I'm an old guy, so I've always been trolling for sermon material and stuff. And I, <laughs> I first found her blog because she had visited an RCA church in the East, which in the Reformed Church of America meant a, you know, very mainline liberal congregation. And she was quite surprised. It was like little girl leaves deep south to find mainline Reformed church in upstate New York. And so then I, I began corresponding with her about it because, oh, there's someone interested in the Reformed faith. Well, let's talk about that. And so you know, we, we corresponded a fair bit and I was, you know, I was fairly active in her blog and on the comment section in those yeah. early years. You know, I, um, I 
I, 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 you know, became aware of her a while ago as a, um, you know, she was a sort of an emergent figure. Remember that? <laughs> the emergent church. That oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you know. Um, and so I was just like, oh, great, you know. And so at a certain point, I just began trying to ignore her because, she, you know, she didn't seem like, you know, like, like somebody really kind of worth following when, once she once she went so so off the rails with, with the affirmation and whatnot of, um, you know, of, of the LGBT lifestyle. Uh, and so, you know, in the wake of that, I'm looking at, I'm scrolling through the hashtags, you know, because of RHE, and, you know, I'm seeing things like, well, because of RHE, I felt, I felt free to, to completely embrace the, the bisexual lifestyle or whatever, and she supported and encouraged me in that, and wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened without her, and so I was like, see, this, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is not good fruit. And, and I can sort of hold that at the same time that I, I hold the fact that it's tragic that she died this way and it's tragic that she left her husband and, and two young kids. Um, these things are messy, you know, they're, they're, they're complicated. And it, I mean, it requires, it requires nuance, I think. What do you think, what do you think, you know, so the guy I just talked to briefly and our time's running out too, but the guy yeah. I talked to briefly before you, I mean, is the, some of the first words out of his mouth were his experience was the mass collapse of propositional truth. And, <laughs> and so he, whereas he didn't, you know, really fully ride the Rachel held Evan train, she came up in our conversation too. It's, it's interesting to me though, again, the, the relationship between Rachel and evangelicalism in terms of it being, governed whereas let's say a, a a a denomination or something especially like the roman catholic or orthodox or even anglican churches you know you have um you have you make vows you have commitments to organization you you have confessional commitments evangelicalism is you know if you grow big enough you you know it's it's sort of the the wild west of celebrity market brit based pastor stuff and, you know, it, it's very interesting because I remember there was a there's a period for which Rachel was doing a lot of speaking and writing and she she wasn't attending church at all. And people called her on that. And, you know, she eventually found her way into the, you know, to be an Episcopalian. I don't even know if she I, I suppose at some point she officially joined. But then even the last, you know, the last her last the last chapter in her life was, again, celebrity book tour with. Um, Nadia Boltz Weber and I mean that whole crowd so it's yeah <laughs> it's just a it's an interesting way of I mean are they doing church or or what exactly what exactly is happening in that space what 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 should we call it or how should we think about it cult of personality well yeah the, and there's you know and, and in all fairness if you look at church fathers you know Cyprian Augustine. I mean, even in that, these, I mean, some of these church fathers were celebrity pastors, Chrysostom. Yeah. So yeah. there's always been this market dynamic. So well, to, to, to bring this back around to Jordan Peterson, as, as we close off here, I often wonder what exactly churches would like Peterson to become, um, you know, because what, what, you know, once he said the magic words, it'd be like, let's, let's get this guy on, on, the, on our speaking circuit <laughs> instead of his speaking circuit, right? Well, you know? What magic words could we imagine him saying? Could you imagine him joining, I mean, Orthodox Church have to go through the process of, of you know, all that submission? You couldn't um, sit still through it. No, no yeah, yeah. You couldn't sit no. still. So uh, Mainline, no, they won't have him. Evangelicals, well, Liberty sure embraced him, but you know, for how long? And I read their, I read their doctrinal statements. I mean, he ain't going to sign that. Um, uh, well, and I, I have a, well, I have a piece coming up that pe people will, will like, I think I wrote this for, for the Federalist responding to a, a Lutheran pastor um, who was saying that Peterson's the head pastor of First Church YouTube. And oh, yeah, yeah. Peter, Peterson had a little, a little wry response. It's like, set your own house in order and maybe you'll get your, your wish. <laughs> it was like, ah, it was, was kind of cute. It was kind of funny. Um, and so I think that, that that pastor wrote that piece from kind of a bubble. Um, so where, I, where, in the yeah. Lutheran, where in the Lutheran family of churches does this guy sit if he's writing for the Federalist? I mean, obviously, he must be over on the conservative end. Yeah, I'm going to say probably uh, 
Missouri Synod. Missouri Synod. Yeah, it'd be one of the conservative ones. I think there are two conservative ones. Then ELCA is the liberal. So yeah. he's definitely not that. He's very, very conservative. Um, but, you know, it was like he was he was working on a sermon and decided to throw Jordan Peterson into it. This is how, how his, his, his post came off well, to I've me. I've done that. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like he doesn't, uh, he doesn't really understand how to, how to appreciate Peterson for what he is. Like, all he can do is sort of pick at all the things he's not. And so it's like, yeah. oh, okay, but that's boring. You know, it's, it's yeah. not, really, not really very interesting. Uh, yeah. And so I, I actually, I'm, I'm, I used your unauthorized exorcist line, Paul. So, oh, so you're colonizing my writing now. I used it as one of the, one of the headers. Well, you colonized my YouTube channel. I can colonize your writing. It's a fair exchange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, but basically what, what I'm saying is just, appreciate Peterson for, for, for what he is doing and, and for what he is. And uh, don't be all Statler and Waldorf about it. You know, they're the two, two old yeah, guys. I know who they are. Yeah. The, well, your audience might not, but you know, the, the, the puppets, they're, they're always, always criticizing like, rah, 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 rah. Jungianism. Well, yeah, he's, he's a Jungian. Jungian. Jung was, Jung was a flake. Yeah. He's a Darwinian. Darwin was all wet, but so what, you know, like, He's, he's, he's cool. Just, just let, let God work. Let God do his thing. All right. One more minute, Esther. And then I got to go. Cause I got someone coming up after you. So anything okay, well, last I, thing you want to say? I, plug? I, I apologize for, for coming in and, and, and colonizing like this. I was trying to. <laughs> you can't help yourself. <laughs> well, well, uh, you know, I was, I was, what I was trying to do is kind of show a different side of my work, I guess, because, um, Actually, if you if you visit, oh, the, and I'm disappointed we get to, didn't get to talk about this. But if you look at my YouTube channel, which I almost never like actually use or update, um, I, I make some film projects there where I, I, I put oh. I put put music together with with movies I see that that have that have kind of touched me. And so that's a side that I don't really get to dis discuss as much, kind of my, okay. my artistic side, because a lot of people, um, I think people get get the misimpression that that I'm a, a, a rigidly cerebral uh cold hard rationalist person you know or whatever it, that's not even remotely uh true and so um that was why i didn't come into like you know correct your epistemology or, or talk about <laughs> or talk about faith or belief or anything like that i just I, I wanted the focus instead to be on things i am passionate about and things i enjoy to kind of show that that other side of me um so that I think the, the music videos I make are, are one of the best ways to sort of understand me and to understand okay. what what touches me, you know. So that's well, cool. that's a new, a new thing I'll I'll throw out there. Well, some folks will go over and look at them. I'm sure they will. Well, as always, Esther, it's a pleasure, and <laughs> <Thank> um, <you. laughs> I will see you on the twitters. Mm. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Bye bye.